Welcome to the Defense and Aerospace Report. I'm Vagam Radian here at the Atlantic Council Think Tank in Washington, D.C., where our guest is Max Brooks, a uh, futurist, uh, author of multiple books, including World War Z and your new book, Minecraft uh, the Island. Uh, and uh, uh, you are also a lecturer at uh, West Point uh, in the Institute for Modern War. Uh, and you also are here in the Art of the Future project at the Atlantic Council. Thanks for joining us. Thank you. I should clarify <clears throat> that I am a fellow at the Modern War Institute at West Point. I'm not affiliated with West Point, which to you defense types, that's a huge <laughs> deal. But to us regular human beings, it's, it's a minor line. Um, and, and I appreciate it and I apologize and thank you for the, for the correction. Um, one of the things that you talked to when you spoke here, uh, there was an Army Futures uh, event and, and you spoke at it. And one of the things you talk about is the military-civilian divide uh, and military-civilian relations. Talk to us, you know, and, and this is coming up every time I was on an on a, um, off-the-record panel discussion with an international group just, just yesterday, in fact, where this issue came up and we spent quite a lot of time talking about it. From your standpoint, what are certain, some of the key issues that that both you know civilians and military leaders need to be thinking about about the future of this critical relationship well I think that it's been uh, really a half century divorce that's been coming it didn't all happen at once I mean it started as as early as the Korean War first war we've ever fought we got rid of war bonds and road to hell paved with good intentions and then you got to the 1970s where you got rid of the draft then in the 1990s, it all became about privatization and efficiency. Uh, but at the same time, you got rid of uh, uh, basically a backstop. You got rid of an insurance policy uh, when everything became about being efficient and it became razor thin. Uh, then the big moment came on 9-11, or rather 9-12, when President Bush told us that we should just pray, hug our kids, and participate in the economy. Right. Go to the mall and spend some money. Right. And so. On the surface, that all sounded like a great idea for those in power because now we've got this military that is completely unchained to the populace. We don't have to justify the cause. We don't have to burden them with the obvious costs. We hide the costs now. Uh, there's no war tax. In fact, we're gonna give them a tax cut. So basically, we have this amazing freedom to do what we want. Uh, and that sounded great probably you know, in September 2001. Now we are, are reaping the whirlwind. Now we understand that this half century sieve mill divide that is the Grand Canyon, it's deprived us of an incredible amount of talent. Uh, it has deprived us uh, basically of all these tools that we need. I mean, basically uh, after 9-11, the private sector, instead of investing in technologies that should have been helping us from a wider war perspective, uh, did things like putting 100 songs in our pockets. I remember when Bill Maher held up the iPad, the iPod Nano, and he said, this, this is what we're doing. This is the greatest achievement of our time in a war for oil. We're not investing in alternative energies. We're not investing in infrastructure or other vehicles or anything that would help us. 100 songs, now 1,000 songs in our pocket. And you, and you see the difference as far as World War II and the Cold War, where the peace dividend was incredible. We came out of World War II uh, with radar, with jet power, with nuclear energy, all these amazing plastics. The plastics industry came out of World War II. All these amazing things. I own a rifle, uh, a bolt action uh, 03A3 Springfield 30 odd 6 rifle wow. made by the Smith Corona typewriter company. Right. So don't tell me that we can't do this. But instead, uh, the best and the brightest in the private sector all went towards creating Tinder while we went and fought the forever war in Afghanistan. Well, so uh, the, the next uh, step for this and where I think it's important is that 1% of the population is serving about 25 million total have been veterans and out of a population of 325 million or whatever we are right now. And Mike Mullen um, used to always talk about um, you know, civilians shouldn't forget the military and shouldn't separate from the military. But he also meant that the military should never separate from society as a whole. Uh, and that this is sort of a two-way street. What are some ways to bridge this? Um, because, you know, one thing that I've written about over the years was more sort of direct and different commission and reserve programs to try to tap the population. That some people, it's okay if they're do not promote nor do not deploy, but that if they have something to contribute, they should contribute in yes. uniform so that folks have more people they know in the military. And they're getting back to that finally now. The military, because of, probably because of Russia and China cyber 
uh, probably because of what happened in the election. I don't know. I don't know the reason for it, but the military is finally getting back to uh, this pilot program of direct commission, where if someone is a cyber expert, they just pluck them out and say, hey, how'd you like to serve your country? And they give them a direct commission, and they don't send them anywhere, and they don't mess with their lives. You just keep doing what you're doing, but now you do it for us, and you get to wear the uniform. And that's a great idea, because we have all this talent out there that no one is tapping, so that's wonderful. Another uh, great bridge that we built that no one is really touting is ROTC. And getting rid of that program, Don't Ask, Don't Tell, has finally allowed ROTC back onto college campuses. And it allows young people who are serving their country to mix with young people who aren't. And that's the most important thing, is just day-to-day -day life, talking to someone to serve their country, because we're creating this, I mean, I'd love to say that I invented this term, the warrior cast, yay. No, I didn't. I completely stole it from J. Michael Straczynski's Babylon 5, where the Mimbari right. race have a warrior cast. But you're getting to a point now where you have enough of an insulated military who intermarry and have all the facilities they need, schools and PXs, and they get their gas on base and their medical facilities. They literally can live in the military bubble their entire life. And well, it's the last bastion of social, I mean, if you look at it, a yeah. military friend of mine was saying, we're the last bastion of socialism left. And then the if they inter, and intermarriage is a big deal, because let's face it, we have so few veterans now that who's gonna understand you? Who's gonna understand what you've gone through except another veteran? And so that way, if they intermarry and then have kids growing up in this military family, the military kids only understand their kids, that is how you get a warrior cast. And so the best way to get rid of that is to get people talking to each other. So ROTC is a great example of that. Um, and, and that was particularly the most selective schools in the country, right? Which after the Vietnam War said, you know, ROTC programs existed, but certainly not at Harvard, Yale, and right. a, a lot of the Ivy League schools. Um, and you've talked about that cyber program, and that was something that was important to Dr. Carter, the last defense secretary. Um, but don't you, do you think that that needs to be expanded more broadly to tap into uh, whether as a writer you have something important to contribute? Oh, yeah. Do we need to expand that program more broadly? Well, I think what we need to do is, is walk the cultural razor's edge because what you shouldn't do is just throw a uniform on anybody because that's really going to offend the professional soldiers and rightfully so because their attitude is listen I I have passed tests that most people cannot pass I have jumped hurdles most people cannot jump and I have earned the right to wear this uniform and if you throw that uniform on anybody then it's not a uniform anymore it's a costume so then what do you do now, the British Royal Navy, uh, in decades past, came up with a brilliant solution. They needed, especially in World War II, they needed qualified naval officers to do exactly what they were doing in their civilian jobs. But if you make them just Royal Naval uniforms, you're gonna offend the sons of Lord Nelson. So they had wavy navy. Same uniform, but instead of the solid stripe right down, they were wavy stripes. Right. What was the Royal Navy Volunteer Reserve? Exactly, like Royal Navy Volunteer Reserve. Wavy. Ian Fleming was yes. one of them. So Lawrence Olivier. So it was wavy Navy. And what wavy Navy did was show the public, you're still a serving Naval officer, but within Naval circles, you're the JV. Right. So that way you, you knew your pecking order. And I think we need to do something like that with the uniforms, with the aesthetics of it. So that way the public knows, yeah, I'm not just a cyber geek. I'm a cyber geek serving my country proudly. But within military circles, you know, okay, you're the professional soldier and I'm serving too. Um, but uh, General Hicks uh, was, who's going to be uh, taking over, uh, well, who's helping to set up the Futures Command. I don't think you could put an army uniform on me. Yeah, I still would not have the Ranger tabs and all of the other things that he's, he's achieved uh, in, in his career. But let me, let me take you to the question of innovation, because you've also spent a lot of time thinking about this. Um, what are the right, from your standpoint, uh, and you've spoken about this uh, very articulately, that sometimes when you have folks from Silicon Valley talk to military audiences, you know, they automatically say, well, you know, fail fast. And as we've heard from so many military leaders, you know, the repercussions in the military is dying. You know, failure has a very close correlation to people losing their lives. Right. So what is... The Which, by the way, I saw that. I, I was at a conference in SOCOM where uh, some very accomplished, you know, very award-winning douche gave a very award-winning lecture 
on about how failure means innovation and failure is important and failure is good. It makes you more nimble and agile and wiser. The problem is because he was so arrogant, he didn't understand he was talking to a room full of uniforms in which failure literally means death. And all he had to do was just put a little button on the end of his lecture and just say, listen, I obviously don't mean combat failure. We can incorporate failure into training, simulations, your enemies, look at what they do, look at what our allies do. We can learn from those failures so we don't have the real failure of losing life and limb. But he didn't do that because, you know, he was accomplished. And so his job wasn't to talk to them, their job was to listen to him. <laughs> well, so um, uh, seeing as how you frame properly uh, the problem, and I do think that the use of that word was, was a first on, on, our, on our program. Uh, I, th I think when we're talking about war, when we're talking about people dying, I think that we don't have time to be polite and civil. Um, and, and I appreciate your passion on this, but what are some of the ways the thoughtful ways, right? I mean, the military is a conservative institution right. for good reason. Uh, and sometimes they can be a little bit too hidebound and not flexible right. enough. But from your standpoint, what because you spend a lot of time in, with the community talking to, to, to folks uh, in all range of jobs from combatant to support, yeah. what are the right ways of thinking about innovation and driving innovation? Well, there's two ways. You gotta, there's inside the military and then there's outside. Why are we leaving everything to the DOD? Why does everything have to be Defense Department? Why This is another reason of the civ-mill divide. We have divorced the causes of war from the general population. I mean, the fact that we're in the Middle East, in Iraq, fighting a war, let's face it, oil, and people were still driving giant gas-guzzling SUVs and Hummers. In World War II, they would have been pulled out of those cars and beaten within an inch of their life if people were doing that. The causes have to be added on to this, and we have to tell the population, here's why these wars matter to you as the individual. And if people hear that, then you will tap the regular innovation of the population. Then when Steve Jobs would say something like, brand new innovation, thousand songs in your pocket, people would say, are you out of your mind? My kid's dying over in the Middle East and you're putting a thousand songs in your pocket? No, I want a car that doesn't burn oil that comes from a country that's training people to kill my kid. So that's one way that you can do it. That's outside the military. Within the military, I think that you can start to award courage under pressure the way you award courage under fire. Because let's, let's face it, as civilians, you lose a job, you get another job. I lose my job every time I write a book. I gotta go write another book. If my book so far you seem to be pretty good at that, so. But if, if I write a book and it totally just eats it and flails and dies, I got another chance, I can go write another book. If you get passed over for promotion in the military, that is serious. Your career's over. There's no second chance. There's no, oh, I'll make it up next week. There's no next week. You do something to blow that chance, you're in trouble. So it creates a culture where you're not always willing to stick your neck out. Not just if you have a good idea, but if someone else has a good idea. You may not be willing to take that risk and risk your career for that good idea. And so one of the solutions that I think we need is the order of the palm. Back in the 50s, there was a movie called Mr. Roberts mm -hmm. with Henry Fonda where he stood up to uh, the captain of his ship. Within the chain of command, there was no mutiny. This was all, you know, it was all above board, legal, ethical, but he still pushed back for the sake of his crew. And he risked everything. He risked his career. He risked his, his transfer to a combat duty. And as a result, his crew got together and literally made a medal and awarded to him the Order of the Palm. And he said, I would rather have this than the Congressional Medal of Honor. And I think that this can be done in the unofficial way where, let's face it, those who've worn the uniform, and I say this as an outsider looking in, they have a bond that civilians like me can't even imagine. It, it goes beyond friendship. It goes sometimes beyond family. And preserving that bond is one of the most important things that they have. I mean, it's the same reason that soldiers who had literally lost limbs lying in hospitals in Germany, their first question was, when can I get back to my comrades, my buddies? When can I go back? So if we foster a culture within the military, if the military fosters a culture within its own ranks where they award courage under pressure, people who will stand up and speak their minds within the chain of command, obviously, 
but risk a promotion, risk a transfer, risk their career for an idea that they know will save lives, that's got to be rewarded the same way a reward is given for jumping on a grenade. Um, that would be uh, actually a really good idea because I know a number of people who came up with game-changing innovative ideas, got acknowledged by their commands for having come up with the innovative idea, and then been punished by not being promoted right. by advocating right. the, the China-breaking idea. I, and I've, I see this all the time. And I don't think they would mind being passed up for promotion. I, they didn't. In each case, yeah. they didn't mind. But, and, and I think that that's important. I think that's got to be rewarded. I think that anyone who wears the Order of the Palm, that's a badge of honor. And I think that that should be something that soldiers should aspire to, to win the Order of the Palm. Um, I, I hope uh, Secretary Mattis is, uh, is watching this program. Mm -hmm. uh, let me take you, um, you mentioned something that was very interesting and something which, you know, I've been spending a little bit of time thinking and talking to people about. Basically, nothing about the way society is organized is probably the way society should be organized. Uh, or we do anything. We do everything because it's the way that we've done things and so ended up in the situation we are. But if you look at resource constraints, climate change, virtually. Are we allowed to say climate change? We're, we're allowed. On the, uh, here we are. Uh, really? Here we are. Yes, oh, we wow. Are. Uh, please, you're, you're Climate welcome. change. Oh, my God. Uh, and uh, we're, uh, but I mean, um, well, look, I mean, whatever is the cause, it's changing. So the question is, if you look at everybody trying to live the way we're trying to live, you yeah. basically deplete the world of all of its resources, right. ultimately, uh, which, which is a very noble aim to increase standards of living. But the trouble is you run out of space, you run out of food, you run out of water, you run out of fish, uh, you run out of oil, uh, or you burn enough of it that it gives you even a bigger problem. Uh, whereas restraint efforts throughout history have, have worked, whether it's on ozone or, or anything oh, else totally. to, to replenish it. So as you think about these big problems, what's the way, and, and if you look at it, the military organism then has a problem also. I mean, a, you know, a, a chief of military, uh, overseas chief of military said this to me recently over a, a, a off the record talk. But one of the things that he said is, you know, what's the next big military idea? Because it's been decades since we had a big military idea, and we are not succeeding at what we're doing. The military lever gets pulled because the military lever has always been pulled. So it's kind of a two-part question. Part one is, what are some ways that actually the world has to think about what the future looks like? And the second piece of it is, what's the next big military idea? Because Harlan Ullman, who's associated with the Atlantic Council, has just written a book where he basically says, we've lost every war since World War II, and we really ought to be learning a lot of clear lessons from having lost all those wars. Well, I think one of the things that, that unfortunately, we are suffering one of America's great cultural weaknesses, which is our isolationism. There are certain things we're very good at, but what we're not good at is thinking and caring about anything that's happening outside our lives, outside our shores. And that was bad enough during the Cold War. A lot of kids got killed in countries like Vietnam, which we had never heard of. Hostages were taken in Iran, which most Americans couldn't even find on a map. As President Obama once said, we can ignore our enemies, but our enemies are not gonna ignore us. And they are studying us. Everybody around the world knows everything about us. We don't know anything about anybody else. And the truth is, there are no more local problems. What is the social issue, the economic issue, the gender issue, the climate issue of today is going to be the military issue of tomorrow. And we're not very good at looking around the world and identifying the potential for violence that is fomenting right now. You know, we're very last minute. Uh, and we're not connecting. And we're reactive. And we're reactive. Instead, what we used to do, and we actually were very good at this during World War II, and we were even pretty good at it during the Cold War, is connecting the military with NGOs, with the press, with other organizations who study these issues and bring them in and say, no, no, no. What you think is a climate issue in this country is going to become a military issue. You know, there's, there's a lot of talk about, uh, I get asked about the, the coming robot war, because I'm a sci-fi writer. And as we know, automation is sweeping the world. So I get asked, are we going to have a robot war? To which I say, oh yeah, but not with the robots. It's going to be with the people who are displaced by those robots. You've got a lot of countries right now up and coming based on cheap labor. What's gonna happen when suddenly in five years, they're all put out of work and they riot. And in order to keep them from rioting, their government tells them, oh, 
uh, go over there. It's their fault. That's hey, how crusades, works. crusades. Yeah. All right, a lot of a uh, lot of knights who were fighting, and and the pope was like, hey, why don't you go over there and wreak havoc on. Uh, on, on those guys uh, over in Jerusalem. Um, but the displacement issue, though, is happening currently as well in the United States. I mean, folks are not paying attention to the fact well, that robotization and, and yes. technological sophistication is costing people their jobs and here. That's, that's, a, that's a major, major issue that we really need to get a handle on. No one has really phrased it in this terms. We're facing a refugee crisis, but we're not facing a refugee crisis from a place. We're facing it from a time. The world is changing at light speed. And that change is leaving refugees in its wake. People who are feeling uh, obsolete, left behind, uh, older, powerless, frightened, frustrated, angry. We saw it in the last election. We had massive amounts of refugees that were left behind by the Great Recession. The economy came roaring back, but not for them. Right. They were left behind. And whenever you have, and I do, all these conferences I go to, all these supposed geniuses, I say, what specific trends do you see coming down the pipeline? But more importantly, who do you see that trend leaving behind? They don't identify it because they're always looking forward. They're always looking at the road instead of looking at the people that they're running over on that road. And we have to start thinking in terms of taking care of refugees from the past because the past is yesterday. Well, I mean, Think about it, self-driving cars, uh, electric cars, right. right? I mean, think about how many people are drivers in the economy. Right. Uh, electric cars, infinitesimal maintenance compared with any internal combustion right. engine. So how many people are displaced in garage, car industry, yeah. repairs, parking lots? You may not need them because the cars are metered. It may be a service. You may not even have to buy one. Right, the cars may go home the minute you get there. They'll just drive home and then they'll come pick you up. So who are we leaving behind? And you can't just say, oh, well, you know, we'll just retrain them. Well, how? That takes a lot. And that, that's a huge issue, is, is people being left behind. Because people are not just going to go quietly into the night. They're going to get angry. And well, they already are. They already are. And sometimes they will vote for the wrong candidate. And sometimes they will pick up guns. And they will be violent. And this is what you see. Look, you see. Especially in places where guns are readily available. Right. And you see this. Look, you see, you see it on the macro. You also see it on the micro. You see it in Afghanistan. You know, uh, when the U.S. Army goes into a village, they think they're doing something great by building a well. They think that, or building a road or building electrification. Oh, that's great. We're bringing change. Well, who are we leaving behind in that village who was benefiting from the status quo? They're going to get mad. They're going to talk to the Taliban. The best example I ever heard of this was President Obama. When he was a community organizer, his biggest adversary was not, say, the mayor or racist cops. It was the black pastors who were benefiting from the status quo. And he was going to come in, this young rabble rouser, and he was going to change. And they pushed back on him because they were going to lose their flocks. So who are the potential losers in this change? And how do we bring them along? instead of leaving them in the dust. How do you, though, in the political climate that we're in, I mean, I, I was at a, a conference in Europe and there were a lot of African military leaders there and China, the issue of China came up. Yep. And, and, one of, and, and one of the senior leaders told me, look, we can't trust China as far as we could throw it. But the fundamental reality is there's been an enormous amount of investment. And where were you guys? You guys haven't been investing in Africa. They are. We have to get it somehow. We have growing yeah. populations, and, and we're in a better place now because of it, even though we may be a little bit beholden to them. Yes. So how do you get the political system in the United States? Because I want to get back into the military side of things in a minute. But how do you get this political system to change where the thinking is, I think, somewhat simplistic, actually, right? If we just give tax cuts, the changes will happen, get government out of the way completely, and, and this revolution will happen. Whereas in each and every single one of these cases, we've seen that absent a plan, which I think John Kennedy, if you go back to 1961, when jobs started leaving the country, were like, okay, here's how, what are the things we have to do to retain jobs and grow? And right. what are, how do you convince people that this is a national imperative because the greatest country in the world could end up suffering very, very badly in a very short, far shorter period of time than. Well, I agree. No, I, and I think that's a two part question. I think when you, when you talk about the fact that we have lost the hard lessons of soft power, 
you know, the reason our deadliest enemies, Germany and Japan, are now our best friends is because we didn't leave them in the ashes, because we, we took the time to invest and rebuild. And that's not economic, that's psychological. Whoever helps a child is going to have the loyalty of that adult. You know, when you're in your formative years, when your brains are forming those crucial patterns, whoever is kind to you and helps you, you will always love them no matter what. And a whole generation of German and Japanese children saw American GIs as saviors. And when they grew up and started running their countries, that is why they have always loved us. And by the way, that's why we lost Russia. We saw the end of the Cold War as just an ending. You know, Francis Fukuyama. Mm -hmm. End of history. Dork. End of history. What an arrogant, anyway. Yeah, the end of history. Well, tell that to the Russians who watched their economy crater and their whole social system collapse. They saw the Cold War as a war and therefore they expected us as the victors to take on the responsibility of rebuilding them and we didn't. We were, we were busy inventing the internet and watching the president do dirty things in the White House. Yay 90s. You know, shagadelic, that was us. And the Russians were like, what, what, we're starving. Wait, wait. And in that vacuum came Vladimir Putin and said, okay, we need to be strong again. We need to be feared again. And therefore we will be safe again. And he became their new czar. I'll make you proud again. Yeah. I'll make you rich again and I'll make you proud again. We lost Russia because we didn't rebuild. And it's the same thing. We're not investing in soft power. And that's a huge problem. So now how, to your actual question, how do we do that? Well, there is a fundamental gap and it's bigger than the Civ Mill gap. It's the gap between the thinkers and the talkers. How many elections have we seen in our life between two candidates where one of them has amazing ideas and can't talk and a talker who has no ideas and who always wins? And we need to, and this is, this is a very, human personal thing. Those who have good ideas need to learn how to become great communicators. You know, part of it is, is not their fault. Part of it is whenever you're in any discipline, you're, you're speaking to your peers, you're speaking their language, and that's okay. You just, you just need to get out of your comfort zone. That's forgivable. What's unforgivable is arrogance and hubris, and I, and I see this at all these conferences, like I said, where these people, they come in with their PhDs and their fellowships and their chairmanships of boards and their TED Talks, and they don't adapt their dusty old lectures one iota to who they're talking to because they don't feel any urgency. They just feel, well, I'm accomplished. And then they just talk and they expect us all to listen and go, oh, okay, even though we have no idea what they're saying. Shame on them. Because th then it's, it's knowledge for knowledge sake. And knowledge for knowledge sake is great. If we're talking about Marcel Proust, if we're talking about linear A versus linear B, if you know, we're, we're analyzing the later paintings of Lucian Freud, uh, great, knowledge for knowledge sake. Not in politics, not in war, not when people's lives are on the line. You could run, you can talk and you have ideas. Right, but I don't have the experience. I wouldn't, I wouldn't vote for me. What am I, I'm a, I'm a writer. I would vote for people who have actionable experience in this world that they're talking about. You know, this is the problem. So uh, literally at all these, at these talks that I go to, at all these forums and symposiums, literally I just, I just said to the people in the audience, you need to challenge us. Anybody who gets up here, you need to challenge us. You need to make us nervous. You need to make us cry because if you're gonna give the blood, the, the least we can do is give a little bit of sweat and tears. Um, let, me, let me go to a um, slightly more military question. Uh, even though I wanna continue this conversation with you, I figure that uh, your, your time is finite. Uh, you are not an engineer, but you have- God, no. <laughs> are you kidding? I took, I took one electrical engineering course in college and yeah, whew, that was bad. Uh, uh, but but y'all got some ideas in that head of yours. So what I want to ask you is, um, looking at it from an artificial intelligence, right? Everybody is talking about artificial intelligence. Yeah. Um, and um, and obviously, absolutely game changing. We saw that part of in the election in some of the algorithms, which are automatic yeah, yeah, intelligence yeah. Uh, that can be abused. Uh, we're seeing the Russians very capably doing that all around yeah. the world. Uh, fortunately, folks are getting you know like any. A tactic or strategy or technology. Yeah, we always right. get sucker punched. That's the American way. It's the American way. Who knew you, you could fly planes off ships? <laughs> what? No. 
madness. Uh, uh, it's, it's the work of the devil. Uh, I'm joking. Um, but let's, uh, when you're talking about artificial intelligence, I was just talking to a friend of mine who was looking at this from a war fighting perspective. And he said, look, we have a whole bunch of limitations that we're putting on it, particularly because of autonomous weapons. Uh, and, and he said, our adversaries may not be as squeamish. They may actually want to build uh, unmanned submarines and equip them with weapons, <clears throat> have uh, AI on them that says, hey, if the sound pressure level is different from whatever I have and a no, right. I just shoot at it. Um, to the sucker punch point. Um, a man-machine interface, you know, others have told me, hey, from a Chinese perspective, uh, if you can experiment on prisoners and a whole bunch of other things, you can actually Yay. install a USB in a, in a soldier, a uh, soldier's head. Uh, talk to us a little bit about how we need to think of this space, right. not from an engineering standpoint, but from a moral standpoint, from an intellectual standpoint, and given where technology is going to be. And this is important. And, and, that, and that's exactly the point, is we've heard this argument many times from the Nazis, from the Soviets and now from the Chinese. You know, we're more efficient than you. We don't have one hand tied behind our back. And to that, I quote an Israeli judge who says, we may have to fight with one hand tied behind our back, but the hand that we fight with is the upper hand. And that goes directly to who we are as Americans. That goes to 1917, why we left our shores in the first place to make the world safe for democracy. And you can be as cynical as you want about it, but that is the American ethos. We fight for a better world. Otherwise, there's no point. You know, we are not a nation state. We're not the Han Chinese. We're not the French. We're not the Japanese. We're not the Persians. We are this hodgepodge of different people coming from different places. And the only thing that holds us together is that code of values. So it's not a luxury with us. It's a necessity. You get rid of those values, we're done. We're fragmented. Call it a day. We're Somalia. And therefore, it will make the fight harder, but it will make the fight right. And you always see our enemies stumble as a result. You know, I use the example of Milai and Lidice, two villages. One was in Vietnam, one was in the Czech Republic. Milai, horrible massacre. Lidice, the Nazis came in, horrible massacre. But the key difference is the US Army tried to hide Milai. Why did they do that? Why was it a massive cover-up? Because the American public wouldn't stand for that. By the same token, the Nazis destroyed Lidice to publicize it. That was literally the idea. It was a propaganda coup. They wanted to broadcast it everywhere because their attitude was, don't screw with us. We're the Nazis. We'll kill everyone in your village. Very Genghis Khan-like. And that's what they were. Might makes right. And it never works. Never in the long term. Why else would half a million Nazi troops be tied down in Yugoslavia when they could basically do whatever they wanted? No rules, no ethics. One sniper takes a shot at you, you kill everyone in the village. Didn't work. It just made more partisans. China can do that. They can have autonomous weapons that act faster. But when you burn an entire Filipino village because of your autonomous weapon, or you sink a Thai fishing vessel, or you accidentally gas an entire Vietnamese city during a war, even though it was an algorithm that told you to do that, you've just turned people against you. We make mistakes, we screw up, and that's why we always have to apologize for it, and we always have to take responsibility for everything we do, because our message to the world is an American partnered world is a better world than a Chinese ruled kingdom. Do you, do you think that does the rhetoric that you hear from the White House worry you from America First to a smaller State Department? Yeah, which is horrible, which, which is ridiculous. Um, America First, what do you mean America First? Uh, unless our commander in chief has this plan to physically lift our country off of planet Earth and put us on Mars where we can just live in our little bubble, great. Otherwise, Big mistake, America first. That's ridiculous. Since World War II, our greatest strength has been team building, not going it alone. World War II was an allied struggle. The first Korean War was a UN struggle. We created the UN. 
NATO is an alliance, an alliance of partners, all listening to each other. And we squabble and we're inefficient. We were a hell of a lot more inefficient than the Warsaw Pact. If we're talking about pure efficiency, getting stuff done quicker, oh, the Warsaw Pact could just snap your fingers and get it done. And yet when the Cold War ended, why did the Warsaw Pact completely implode and NATO endured? Because it's a partnership and partnerships are hard. And it's the same on a person to person relationship. A marriage is difficult and you argue and you fight and you go back and forth. But if it's worthwhile, you endure as opposed to having master and slave. Well, America wants to be married to a free, democratic, fair world. China just wants to be master. And, from a, and so from a rhetorical standpoint, that's why it's important for us to be talking about human rights, morality, yeah. what's right, as opposed to being transactional. No, that matters. Human rights matter. These are not hippy-dippy ideals that we can blow off for some university campus in Northern California. Human rights matter. It's the exact same reason that we won the Cold War. It's the exact same reason that people still look to us for help. Nobody's trying to replace us. China is not going around the world saying, hey, if, you, if you're looking for human rights, Tiananmen Square, right here. Russia is not saying, oh, Putin's not saying, oh, Tovarich, who better to be with human rights than us? We invented Gulag, come with us. No, Americans are, we are arrogant and dumb. Wow, can we be hypocritical? But that's the American story, is not abandoning our ideals, but trying to live up to them. If our cops are shooting black people in the back, it's a horrible thing that we have to have a national dialogue about. If the cops shoot people without probable cause, that's, we call that a national scandal in America. You know what they call that in China? Good policing. Um, uh, I'm, I, I'm, I'm going get, to get back on the, the military track. Um, let's talk about education. Um, you've prominently talked about some of your uh, challenges. Everybody learns differently. Yeah, I'm very dyslexic. Very, very dyslexic. Uh, and, and, and uh, you know, I, I, people come up with systems to work through in order to be able to, you know, uh, you know work, work around what, what some of their uh, deficiencies may be in, in, or not deficiencies, but just differences in how they learn. Yeah. As you look at the military education system, what are, uh, which, which tends, it's, it's always working to try to reform itself. Right. But what are some some different techniques in a higher paced technological world, in a different technological world, where you're confronted with a lot of information, you may have to learn things you did not expect to know very, very quickly. What are some ways to think about it? Well, I, I think, and learn it? strangely enough, in some ways, we don't have to go to the future. We can go back to the past. You know what the Army used to be awesome at? Was making comic books. The Army used to have a whole division that did nothing but turn its manuals into comic books. I have a manual from Will Eisner, the father of modern comics, of how to use the M16 rifle. The Army was great about that. When we had a draft army, uh, they, the brass would reach out to comic book creators and be like, listen, can you take this boring, dry work that we're doing and put it into a medium that young people are already reading? Well, and cartoons, right? I mean, you used to have oh cartoons on I weapons and systems. I know how to field strip and operate an anti-tank rifle because I watched Goofy do it in a Disney cartoon. They used to be great at doing these educational films. So I think we need to get back to that. We need to invest more in the talent pool that we have and take all this instructional, what I say, printed ambient, into something that people are already interested in. So. For example, I, I did a program with the Atlantic Council with the Marine Corps where they took their threat assessment report and turned it into a short story workshop. And we got sailors, Marines, a Coastie. We had one young Lance Corporal Marine from Cyprus flew in 72 hour pass. And we took all the data in the report and they turned it into short stories. Brilliant. We're doing something at the Modern War Institute now where we have all these amazing reports we're generating, but they're locked up in written reports that nobody has time to read. These are, you know, the military, they got 25 hour work days. So we're recording it on audiobooks. So when they're in the gym or they're, they're running or they're driving to work or they're on the train, they can listen to all this. So there's different means of education. Some are new, some are old, but we need to get back to that. 
I think every military system ought to be controlled by, by an Xbox controller or an iPhone, and we will be able to kick anybody's butt in the world. Oh my God, every, every new recruit would be able to do that. Uh, I have to ask every author about their book, uh, Minecraft, uh, The Island. Yes. Talk to us a little bit about it. It's out earlier this year. Yeah, the book, said... the book dovetails exactly what we're talking about with education. Uh, most video games that we grew up on are very linear. <clears throat> There's a right and wrong way to solve a problem. Every time you solve that problem the right way, you get bumped up a level, just like our school system just like in the corporate world. And that is 20th century thinking, and that is obsolescent death. What Minecraft does is it plops you in a virtual world of blocks, and you have to survive. Now, there's many ways to solve a problem. Let's say the problem is don't starve. Uh, you can farm, you can fish, you can forage, you can hunt. There's many ways to solve the problem. Uh, you can be creative when you solve the problem, which is great exactly how you need to do it in the real world. Because nowadays, change is coming at you so fast that every time you write a rule book, you better throw it away. I said yesterday at the Atlantic Council Forum, there's no more experts. Anytime someone says they're an expert, I say, wait a day. You'll be a student. So Minecraft trains your brain to be innovative and also flexible. Because literally, you can build a big, beautiful house in Minecraft and it'll burn down by mistake. Some creeper monster will come and blow it up. Well, you gotta rebuild. It teaches you resilience. So it teaches all these great skills I've been trying to teach my son. It took me 40 years to learn. So when the Minecraft folks came to me and said, would you be interested in writing a Minecraft novel? I was like, oh my God, are you kidding? So it's just a story of someone on an island like Robinson Crusoe, but it's the Minecraft world. And every chapter, I sort of pepper it with a life lesson that Minecraft has taught me. Uh, last uh, question. So as you think about the future, what's the next big military idea? Well, an idea that I would like to see is getting back to investing in people. <clears throat> every, every military conference I go to, it's tech. It's tech, 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 tech. Uh, I would like to hear less about AI and more about HI. I'd like to hear more about investing in human resources, and I, and I don't mean you know the person you go to when someone's inappropriate with you, I mean literally the resource of human beings and, and keeping them and, and retaining talent because the military is bleeding talent. I would like to address that issue because it takes so much time and effort to train these people and then they leave. And they're the difference. And they're the difference. It doesn't matter what amazing machines you have if you've got a moron operating it. We've got really smart dedicated, capable people that we are not taking care of. I've always said when I was a kid in the 80s, the streets of my hometown were, were just paved with Vietnam vets. And the message I took was, hey, if you join the military, that's waiting for you. So there needs to be a crash program to take care of our vets. And I don't mean throwing money at the problem. I mean maybe going into the bureaucracy with a flamethrower and starting from day one. Because we're losing, I think, still statistically, we're losing more soldiers to suicide than combat deaths. How is that not Pearl Harbor happening every day? How is that not a national outcry? We go on a Twitter rant when Steve Martin compliments Carrie Fisher for being beautiful, but we don't go on a Twitter rant where there's a bridge near my hometown that vets routinely jump off of. We need to take care of them. Because if we don't take care of our old soldiers, we're never gonna get any new ones. You know, an interesting thing, though, for our father's generation was everybody was in the military, right. so it was not special. No. So it was a, well, everybody was in the military. Yeah, you did it, you served, and then everything changed. So now we have a volunteer force. Well, you better take care of those volunteers. Do you think that a draft would actually be a good thing or some drafted national service model? Yeah, not a military draft, because the truth is the wars of tomorrow, you just are not going to need millions of Americans in uniforms. You don't need just trigger pullers anymore. That was the problem in Vietnam, sending these massive amounts of draftees when a small professional force would have done a lot better. But I do think some level of national service would be great, but that's the end of the road, not the beginning. It took us 60 years to divorce ourselves from our government, which by the way is a government by, of, and for the people. You know, you can say to the Chinese, I love you, but I hate your government. You can say that to the Russians, the Iranians, the Koreans. You can't say that to us. You can't say I love the American people, but I hate their government. No, 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 no. That's that's us. We put that government in there. We voted for it or we didn't vote for it and let it get voted in. So 
I think we need to get back to teaching civics in the classroom, teaching appreciation about America. Um, I'm going to say something very radical. Personally, uh, I would have no problem with deporting everyone who didn't vote and replacing them with immigrants. Because immigrants appreciate this country and immigrants care. Immigrants are willing to fight for it, they're willing to pay their taxes, they're willing to vote. They're coming from countries where the difference is clearly obvious. They're my grandparents who say, hey, you, know, you finish your plate. You don't know what it's like. People are starving over there. That was my dad would, yeah. would tell us all the time, you know, don't say you're starving. There right. are people who are there actually starving. There are people who are starving. really starving. Eat those peas. And so I think anybody who takes this amazing, wonderful country that we have built and people have died for, for granted. People who have died for the right to vote from Iwo Jima to Alabama, let's not forget, they weren't just foreign wars, they were fights right here. Anybody who takes that for granted, goodbye. Go, 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 go. There, there's plenty of people in Mexico or South Sudan who would love to come here and build a better life and a better country, and, and I'll take them. But from a civil, the last question, I have to ask you this because I'm not sure we got as, uh, from a civil military divide standpoint, though, what are ways to repair it? You know, as you said a couple of times, it's taken 60 years to get here. Right. What are the things we have to do to bridge that that go beyond just a reserve program, for example? Because there are those who fear that, God forbid, there are more soldier, as we saw in the Vietnam, a troubled vet. You know, yeah. uh, they've you know shot up the post office or whatever. That the American population could turn on vets. Right. What, what, are, what are some other systems other than just... I've thought about it. I've got a crazy new idea. It's a crazy new radical idea. Make sure when we go to war the cause is just. Craziness, I know. But if it is a cause that the entire country is behind and we believe that it is actually winnable, and it, and it matters. Make sure that that cause matters to the world and therefore matters to us. If we do that, then the government has the moral authority to ask of its citizens. If it is a war that is truly right and truly just, then citizens should have no problem being asked by war bonds, maybe ration, Maybe don't drive around in a giant honking SUV if uh, oil is the reason. You know, maybe do something and contribute because I support our troops shouldn't be an empty gesture, shouldn't be a bumper sticker. If the cause is just, I support our troops should be a way of life. Max Brooks, thank you very much. One of the most interesting conversations we've had this year. Thank you very much. Thank you.